the Individual Investor Show. You bought it all, don't you? Share one thing, they all need money. Now let's see if they're brave enough to earn it. Hello, and welcome to the Individual Investor Show. My name is Jennifer Shear, your host for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you all had a wonderful week. So in Chicago, we just had our first significant snowfall of the year. So we are bundling up all week here in the Midwest. We are so excited to bring you yet another II show. Tonight's event is the Individual Investor Show, Two Easy Ways to Take Control of Your Stock Investing. I want to preface tonight's presentation by reminding our viewers that AAII is a nonprofit educational group and is not a financial advisor, and thus is not able to give personal advice. Every investor is different. That's why our goal with each broadcast and article is to educate you on how to make better financial decisions. We are overjoyed by how many people attended our last II show, and as always, we really appreciate the support. And if you have any questions for me or suggestions about upcoming topics for the show, feel free to reach out via the comment section below. So, as we enter the new year, there's always some uncertainty when it comes to investing. Thankfully, we were able to chat with Charles Rotblut, AAII journal editor and creator of the Prism Wealth Building Academy, about the importance of voting your proxy. Many stock investors fail to vote on corporate board nominees and other company issues when they receive their proxy statement. So we also chat with Rotblut on how to approach the various sections of the proxy form. So in the second part of tonight's broadcast, we sit down with John Bachkowski, President and CEO of AAII, for an annual update on our Model Shadow Stock Portfolio, which screens for potential small cap stocks and was created by our late founder, Mr. Jim Clunan. Bachkowski discusses its performance over 2021 and explains changes that were made to the portfolio during its fourth quarter review. You will not want to miss these exciting interviews that can help you invest smarter in the new year so you can take control of your financial destiny. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy your presentation. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for joining me today. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing your newest article in the January uh, issue of the AAII Journal. And uh, it's focused on analyzing the annual performance of our model, model shadow stock portfolio. And my first question is, uh, what is the model of the shadow stock portfolio? The Metal Shadow Stock Portfolio really kind of grew out as a, an attempt to take some of the academic research that we saw out there and try to take it, take this academic information, this research. We always see uh, uh, stuff out there that says, you know, this type of strategy works best. How can one actually uh, take a, a concept, a financial concept, and, and use it to build uh, specific quantifi quantifiable rules that can follow. So the shadow stock portfolio is a, uh, a micro cap, small cap portfolio that looks at the value segment of the small cap market environment. And uh, we've been doing it now for, for over 28 years. And uh, Jim Clunan, our, our, our late founder, uh, was again, had read all this wonderful information about how small caps do well historically and tried to go ahead and build at it a a practical portfolio, understanding that when you are dealing with micro cap stocks, um, it can be very costly to trade micro cap stocks. So we tried to come up with a rule where basically once a quarter, he would look at uh, what information the companies release from their financials and would use that to A, construct a portfolio and B, make decisions on what stocks to buy or sell from the portfolio. And it evolved over time as well. So uh, it was a kind of an experience that we shared with our members on uh, the learnings we had over time. So it's, it's, it's appropriate for someone who wants to take a look at uh, some small cap exposure in their portfolio and fi following a very quantifiable rule to go ahead and, and invest in that. And uh, why, why would, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, why would an investor want to focus on shadow stocks when compared to large caps? Well, what we found over time is that um, not all, the whole stock market is not the same. Uh, and, you know, obviously we hear a lot about uh, large cap companies they are in the news all the time. But if you go back uh, historically, uh, you'll find that uh, there's, a, there's a big universe of securities out there. Uh, and uh, historically, the small cap companies, the, the future growth companies of the world, uh, they tend to actually provide better long-term rates of return, uh, but they're also riskier. Uh, and uh, they also tend to perform a little bit differently than large cap stocks. So the one 
potential advantage to adding a small cap component to your portfolio is that you might increase your rate of return slightly of your portfolio. Uh, and it might also add a little bit of a diversification element as well, where there are times where small cap stocks will do better than large cap stocks. It'll help even out some of that particular variability to your portfolio. Uh, but with the understanding is that like any kind of investment, it, it is a little bit riskier and it does take a long-term perspective for it to hold true. Uh, small cap stocks uh, have been shown to have uh, periods of underperformance, uh, like a, a, they almost call it, they call it serial correlation, I guess, academically, but they tend to go in streaks, uh, hot streaks and cold streaks. And actually we're coming off a fairly low, long cold streak for small cap stocks. Uh, large cap stocks have been dominant uh, over the last several years. And only is it this year where we're seeing a resurgence in small caps. That's really interesting. And to kind of uh, highlight the background of the model of shadow stock portfolio, uh, what is the philosophy and strategy um, that you guys used uh, to create it? Yeah, well, we're trying to follow a very quantitative rule. So we're looking at the intersection of the smallest 10% uh, part of the, of, the, of the overall cap universe of, of stocks, so very small micro cap companies. These are companies that are typically too small for most institutional investors to buy in. And uh, on top of that, we're trying to look at the ones that are really on the value side of the equation. So they're, they, they, Fama French did some research that sort of the, the rules of this portfolio are based upon. He found that both of those, typically the smaller a company, the better its long-term performance over time. And also uh, typically speaking, if a, a company is cheaper using a metric such as price to book, the cheaper that company, the better the long-term performance over time. And those are both factors that actually can work independently or you combine them together. So the shadow stock portfolio is, is the intersection of that, that small company that's cheap. And we call them shadow stocks because they're so small in most cases, they're trading really in the, in the shadows of Wall Street. Uh, they're kind of, they're not in the spotlight so much. So they're a, an opportunity for uh, you to perhaps find some of tomorrow's gems when it comes to the marketplace. And so what we try to do is understand that when you're dealing with this kind of uh, environment, you really can't actively buy and sell them. You can't be a trader. So we're trying to minimize the amount of transactions that we do. So we only look at them quarterly. I mean, it's shocking, you know, it's not ignoring these stocks, but basically once a quarter, in fact, the January issue of the journal was meant to be our quarterly review. And we always start off with looking at you know, how big a company can we buy and how cheap should it be using metrics of price to book and market cap, uh, whether or not there, there's any profitability concerns with these stocks. So once a quarter, we look at the portfolio, see if any stocks are candidates using very quantifiable rules to sell. And then if there's any new candidates out there. So we did that this past uh, December, and we found out that nothing really, nothing was too large, nothing was too expensive, and nothing was, uh, had negative earnings that forced us to sell it. So we didn't have any transactions to sell. So we just kind of talked a little bit more about what the marketplace was doing in the last year and how one should go ahead and look at these things over time. And you touched a little bit about um, current market trends. Um, how, is, how are these reflected uh, within the specific portfolio? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's tough that, you know, COVID has become, I guess, perhaps the, the, the major talking point uh, in not only our, our day-to-day lives, but our investment lives for the last uh, two years. And um, the, what we found is that uh, on the initial, um, the, the downturn, uh, the initial reaction from when uh, COVID became apparent and we're concerned about a market downturn, really the, the the volatility came forward and, and small caps like shadow stocks really fell a lot harder than large cap stocks. But then once the market kind of came back from that, we had that, that severe and, and, and terrible downturn, then they had a very sharp upturn. And once people saw the opportunities where the worst might be behind us, we actually saw in that case, uh, the small com companies actually do a little bit better than large cap companies. The other kind of, I guess, underlying thought process that occurred is that Typically, small cap companies are more domestically focused. Uh, they're typically a little bit more nimble. So in an inflationary environment where uh, companies have to pass on their rising costs to customers, more often than not, smaller companies tend to do that a little bit more easily than large companies. So also in an inflationary environment, sometimes small cap companies did better. So that was sort of the, I guess, the overall marketplace that existed for small caps this year and even last year. 
past year, we had a, a severe and, and sudden downturn and then a, a quick uptick on the small caps. And this year, uh, in the first half of the year, when things were very positive about the whole COVID thing, the small caps did really, really well, uh, spectacularly well. And then uh, as some concerns came about more recently, they typically fell a little bit harder. Uh, overall, they're doing very well for the year. I mean, they're up 35.6% through November uh, versus, uh, you know, 23% for the S&P 500. Doing quite well, uh, but then there's a little bit more volatility involved in that. And to go off of the, like, you know, in the new year, we're not really sure what to expect, um, you know, with volatility or, you know, sudden market changes. Um, how can AAII members uh, best utilize the model shadow stock portfolio uh, beginning in the new year? Well, the new year is, 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 is a great time to, first of all, just take a, a step back. And I would, ha first of all, I recommend uh, people have not done so yet, uh, take a look at uh, the PRISM Academy that we're doing and look at those videos. Because I think it all starts off with really the whole notion of understanding what your goals are financially. And the new year is a perfect time to do that. Uh, take a look at your allocation. And uh, you know, what, has, what, what stocks have done well or poorly in your portfolio and what sectors have done well or poorly in your portfolio. So the first question you really wanna ask is, do small caps have a place in your portfolio? And that's, I think, your question number one. And we have absolute allocation models that help identify perhaps how much you should allocate to your portfolio. So the goal, first of all, is do you have room for small caps in your portfolio? And then secondly, do you want to actively manage your portfolio? Do you wanna buy and hold your stocks directly yourself? Or do you wanna use a mutual fund? So if you want to go ahead and take time and effort to build a portfolio of stocks that match up with the small cap portion of your portfolio, the shadow stock is, is, is I think, a, a wonderful way to do that. Uh, the transactions aren't too frequent, uh, and there is very quantifiable rules to follow that. In fact, on our website, if you go to the, uh, the models section of our website and click on shadow stocks, uh, what you'll do is you'll find the current portfolio Every day we're giving you fresh shadow stock ideas and the rules that we have and the tips on how to consider buying and selling, how to place an order are all located in that one area. And so again, first decide if shadow stocks make sense for you, if you have a longer term perspective. If you need your money in a year, it's not the right place for you. If you have you know, a five year, a 10 year horizon and you wanna increase your, 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 your exposure to this kind of explosive part of the marketplace, it does make sense. And um, is there anything else you'd like to highlight from your January Journal article about the portfolio? Well, I really thought it was interesting because, I mean, so much of the, we're talking about how the S&P 500 is doing and, um, you know, hitting new highs. But what's interesting about when you have an index like the S&P 500 is, is very often uh, some of the large cap components, uh, will, because it is a, a cap weighted index where the largest companies dominate the performance, is you might think things are going swimmingly, but in reality, uh, the market breadth or how the overall companies are doing could be quite different. So we found, for example, that even though uh, the S&P 500 itself was hitting new highs and just a few percentage points off of its overall market level, there were a lot of companies that were really suffering this year. Uh, and a lot, I mean, half of the small cap stocks that are in the S&P 500, I'm sorry, the S&P small cap 600, half of them were down more than 20% from their high this, at the end of November. So on the surface, it may seem like we're hitting new highs and things are going well, but what was happening in reality is we have a rotation going on. So some stocks are being sold, some stocks are being bought. So uh, be cognizant that you can't just look at one number or one index to get a sense for how the overall marketplace is doing. It helps to look at a number of different indices you know, small, mid and large, and also look at how the general stock market is doing and, and look at, at things such as market breadth to get a sense for how healthy the stock market really is. Great, thank you so much. And I appreciate you sitting down with me to chat or chat with me today, uh, John, oh, I, a, I learned a lot. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure, thank you so much. And uh, I wanna remind members that um, they can read the January issue of the AAII journal uh, by visiting aaii.com slash journal. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I hope everybody uh, has a great uh, new year. Well, thank you. Thank whole, you. Uh, as, as, as I think Derek would say, green arrows, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, take care and uh, have a great evening. Thank you, you too. Thanks. Hi, Charles. Thanks so much for joining me today. 
I wanted to highlight a few key aspects from the AAII's January journal issue about proxy statements. And my first question is, what are proxy statements and how do they work? Sure, proxy statements are essentially a ballot. It gives shareholders the ability to have some say uh, on how the company's, the company's direction, how executives are being paid, who the auditor is. And most investors will find out about proxy statements is they'll get an email from the broker. Uh, typically, if they log into the broker's account, there might be a little icon as a notification that there's proxy ballots uh, available. Uh, they still can be mailed to shareholders, uh, but that's increasingly rare. Uh, most of the time, they're just sent electronic, uh, and they're pretty simple and straightforward to fill out. You just simply read the question, click on a box, uh, put your control number, and hit submit. Um, you obviously can attend a shareholder meeting to vote your proxy in person. It's not very frequent. Uh, most shareholder meetings don't have very many individual investors, uh, but if you do go, um, it may give you the chance to interact with the company's executives directly. Okay, that's good to know and get, get a little bit more information about what they uh, what goes into proxy statements. And so should individual investors vote their proxy statements? Yeah, you know, I think they should. And here's how to think about it. When you own shares in a company, you're an owner. And you often hear about how the share price is going to go up to this price or about these trading strategies. And it's the concept that shareholders are owners is often lost. But equity is ownership in a company. When you own shares, you own a certain percentage of the company. So this is your ability to speak of as to speak out as an owner, saying, you know, here's how I here's the direction I think the company should go in. Here's who I think should be on the board of directors. Here's what I think about this proposal. Um, here's what I think you should do in terms of the current auditor. So it's your chance to as an owner to express your interest. And so I think it's really important to vote your shares and let the management know that I'm an owner, I'm engaged, and I am gonna raise my hand and share my opinion with you. It helps to hold management accountable if they see more and more individual investors voting their proxy statements. That makes sense. And if an investor wanted to see a proxy statement, how would they go about finding it? Well, there's two big ways. One, if you're a shareholder, you'll get that notification from your broker um, and you can just look at the form. Uh, if for some reason you don't get it, or more importantly, if you're not a shareholder and perhaps you're looking at a company and you want to invest in it, but you want to do some research and see what was on the last proxy statement, you can actually go to the SEC's Edgar database, it's E-G-G-A-R. We actually link to this in John Dysher's article. And you want to look for a form and it's actually labeled form D-E-F, Dog Elephant Frank 14A. And that's a proxy statement. And you can find it for any company, regardless if you own shares or not, but that allows you to see what's in the proxy statement and what covers it. Uh, the other form you can look for on the SEC's website, that Edgar database, is form NPX. That's N as in Nancy, dash PX, Peter, um, xylophone, I guess is a good word for X. Um, and that actually tells you how mutual funds have voted on proxy statements in the past. If you, want, if you own a mutual fund, or you're curious about how mutual funds might have voted for a certain company in the past, you can actually look at that and see their voting record. So that gives you some information. If you wanna try and get some guidance about how you should vote your proxy, you might find that in that document as well. And what are some key traits an investor should look for uh, in a board of directors nominee? So when you're voting on a proxy statement, you'll see the list of names and a little bit of background, and you want to do a little bit of research if you really want to make an informed uh, vote. One of the things I think independence is important. Have a director who actually is separate of the company uh, that hopefully will bring an outsider's view. Um, if they have expertise in one of the company's business lines, that's even better. Or maybe perhaps they have an accounting background, uh, which is important if they're you know, serving the audit committee or they're serving the compensation committee. Um, we, whenever I look at stock, I also look at control. And I look, actually look in the SEC Form 10K. That's an annual filing required by the SEC. Um, and I just do a search for voting rights or, or, or voting control. Um, and if I see a company that whose uh, shareholder owns or controls more than 50% of the voting power, I'll, we will tend to avoid those companies in the AI model portfolios. Those tend to be, they can be controlled companies or they can be a company which just has a majority shareholder controlling all the votes. That means you as a shareholder, you could vote against 
every single thing on, a, on the proxy statement, but that single shareholder wants, says, you know what, I'm in favor of this, and they get to control of it. Now, sometimes it's one shareholder. Um, sometimes you'll see a family that control the ballot. So, and it doesn't necessarily make it a bad stock, but it means as a shareholder, you have less control and you're beholden to whatever that executive or that key shareholder wants to do in terms of the governance of the company. So from a governance standpoint, it can be a red flag. Um, and it's a warning sign. As I said, it's not necessarily a reason to completely not own the company, uh, but it's something you should be aware of. But as I said, for our portfolios, for instance, with VMQ stocks, um, as a rule, I just, I pass on those companies for the model portfolio. Um, you also want to look for a board that's listed as being staggered. That means different board members, their terms expire in different years. And the reason why that matters is if you have a board of directors that aren't very good, or perhaps you have some outsiders who are looking at the company, thinking the company is undervalued, maybe it's not being managed properly, it's, very, it's harder to overturn that board. Um, and the only reason you'd have a staggered board is you want to keep outsiders from changing out the board. You're, you're a company and you like your board and you don't want anyone to come out and say, I want to do a big change. So it's very self-serving to have a staggered board. But as an investor, your self-serving interests are your own, not the company's. And therefore, I would not be supportive of any proposal that calls for a staggered board. And in fact, I would encourage the company to drop that and go to a period where more board members have their term expire at the same time so they can be turned over if change is needed and warranted. That's very interesting. And there's frequently an advisory vote on compensation. How should shareholders vote? This is interesting. John Dyshoner's article goes into it. Um, you know, ideally you wanna look for how are the executives being paid and are they being paid in a manner that leads the company to perform better? You don't, you don't want a, a compensation plan to focus too much on short-term performance. You don't want a compensation plan that looks at the stock prices as well, stock prices drop. So we're gonna give you more options. That's not in your benefit. You wanna look for a really a compensation plan that looks at what the, the CEO and other executives are doing and really ties their pay to value building exercises. Are they being compensated for improving cash flow? Are they being compensated for growing the business, for growing earnings? Those types of things you wanna reward the CEO for. Um, but you do want to pay attention to bonus, to, to overall pay. Um, that said, I do think a very talented CEO is worth their pay, but not every CEO is really good. And we know overall CEO compensation is just too high. Um, the other thing is just is retention bonuses. And this is something that always irks me because a retention bonus is basically, hey, we're going to give you some money so you don't leave the company it really doesn't benefit shareholders in most cases. In most cases, you're giving the CEO a lot of money to stay and do his job. And that doesn't necessarily benefit you as a shareholder. So when you hear about these golden parachutes, it's basically a retention bonus. There can be situations, however, where a retention bonus is justified, uh, particularly if the company's really struggling and they bring in a new executive team to turn it around. Um, if there's a case where business conditions are really tough and you want the CEO to help the company get through it. Um, or a case where there are mergers going on and you wanna have that continuity. Uh, but by and large, I am against retention bonuses and I don't think they necessarily favor investors. Uh, the CEO is being paid to stay there and the CFO is being paid to stay there and do their job, not to collect an additional bonus uh, because the board of directors is friendly towards them and they wanna give them additional incentives. Yes, I agree. I, I can see where uh, you would want, want that. And then uh, do you have any tips regarding shareholder proposals? Yeah, I think the one thing is particularly just read the proposal, understand what you're voting on. And if you're busy, you don't really have time to read a proposal and you're like, hey, you know what? I just want some quick advice. What should I do? Um, it's not the ideal thing. I will point this out. You're always better off reading through it. But if you just want your voice to be heard, just abstain. Do not, you often... And that proxy belt, you'll see, you know, the company's board directors recommend you do this, recommend you do this. If you click abstain, you're not saying yes or no, but you are saying withhold my vote from this particular issue on the ballot. And what that does, it takes one vote away from actually approving the, approving the proposal or approving the vote. So you're basically, in fact, starving the approval process. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I'm a small shareholder. My shares may not make a difference. 
But what it does do is it lets the board of directors, lets the CEO know, I am a, I am a shareholder, I am going to speak up, and I am watching what you're doing. So even though your shares by themselves may not come anywhere close to swaying the vote, you are raising your voice and you are letting the, share, the CEOs and the board of directors know that you are watching them and you are paying attention. So if you're actually better off just voting abstain than not voting at all, just so they know you're there. Um, but if you are going to take the time to read through the proxy, understand there'll be a pro or con to a lot of proposals, read through them. Um, and sometimes you might have to do additional research to see what's going on, because just because there's a proposal doesn't necessarily mean the proposal's good. Uh, sometimes, for instance, you'll see shareholder uh, initiatives. I mean, it might be a shareholder that has a certain special interest you're trying to push through. Maybe it's a hedge fund trying to gauge seats. Um, Maybe it's someone tied to some type of ESG initiative. Maybe they want the company to do more on carbon, on reporting on its carbon footprint. Um, and it's because their interest is environmentally, you know, concerned versus what the business is doing. Now, that's not to say ESG initiatives are bad, but you, when there is a shareholder proposal, realize the person putting it on there might have their own agenda. And it's up to you to decide whether or not you agree with that agenda. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing is, like I said, just take the time to just go through the go through the uh, proxy ballot, and as you catch your as you cast your vote, just take a second and take a step back and look at what you voted, and make sure the votes are what you wanted. The extra five seconds of just reviewing your proxy ballot, um, you know, makes helps you avoid any unwanted mistakes. That makes a lot of sense. And then, is there anything else you want our viewers to know about proxy statements and the voting processes? Well, I think the one thing is you want to be an engaged shareholder. You want to know what your company is doing. And a proxy statement is one of those things. Um, I often encourage investors to just go through the 10K. It's, again, it's an annual filing required by the SEC. You'll see stuff in there that's not necessarily on the proxy ballot, but it gives you an overview of what's going on with the company. Uh, and you don't need to read it word for word because you'll, you'll doze off and probably crash your head on your keyboard. Uh, but you'll find little things about the company, sometimes very positive things about what the company is doing. Uh, you'll learn more about the company's competitors. Um, and sometimes you'll find things that are red flag that might make you say, I don't necessarily feel good about it. Sometimes it might be a related party transaction uh, where the company's buying warehouses from one of the board directors. I've seen this happen. Um, you might see the company have tax issues in Central and South America. I've seen that happen. Um, so sometimes you'll find these little red flags that might cause you to take a step back and go, I really don't know if I'm comfortable with this risk. Or I'm not really comfortable with this behavior. And it might change your opinion. And again, you don't have to read the document word for word. Just skim through it. And you're really looking for some red flags that might make you uneasy or some information that might actually reaffirm your, your belief that this is a good company uh, and one you want to be an investor in. Excellent. And uh, thank you, Charles. I appreciate you setting aside time to chat with me today. Sure. Anytime, Jenna. And uh, I want to remember remind members that um, you can read our January 2022 journal issue by visiting www.aaii.com slash journal. And uh, yeah, take care, Charles, and have a great evening. You too. Thanks. And now for a message from our friends at Discover Bank. We know as individuals interested in building investor wealth, you never want your money to be idle. Even small dollar amounts for short amounts of time should be working for you. With that, we're pleased to share information from our partner Discover Bank on deposit accounts that keep your money moving. You can choose from several options to help you meet your short-term or long-term financial goals. The best part? All of the deposit accounts offer preferred member rates. Take a look. With Discover, you can earn over five times more interest than the national savings average with preferred member rates and pay no fees. That's no fees, period. Plus, no minimum balance is required. You can access your AAII member savings account with Discover Bank from your smartphone or tablet, so it's easy to keep your money moving in the right direction. Open an AAII online savings account to start saving for the future today. Visit aaii.discoverbank.com to learn more. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. I want to thank Charles Rotblatt and John Bachkowski for making time to chat with me today. 
After speaking with them both, I now know the importance of voting your proxy so your voice can be heard when it comes to your investments. As far as my investments go for the new year, I plan to delve into the Model Shadow stock portfolio a little bit to find some new stock opportunities. And as always, please remember to click the subscribe button if you'd like to be alerted of future II shows. And you can read both articles from Charles and John in the January 2022 issue of the AAII Journal by visiting aaii.com journal. And if you'd like to catch a replay of tonight's broadcast or share it with friends and family, you can visit our YouTube channel tomorrow afternoon. Lastly, if you'd like to register for upcoming online events like the Individual Investor Show or our Wednesday webinars, visit aaii.com webinars. And with that, we wish all of you viewing good health, good fortune, and a great evening. Thank you all and take care. Happy investing.